Good evening. It is again time for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We are in the book of Galatians. We started that last week in Galatians chapter 1. We'll continue in chapter 1 in just a moment. Before we get started, if you would, let's bow for a word of prayer as we open our Bible study together. Our Father in heaven, we're indeed thankful for this another beautiful day that you've allowed us to wake up, that you've allowed us to be together, that you've allowed us to study from your holy word. Father, please help us always to understand the preciousness of your word, the preciousness of your dear son Jesus, who came, suffered, and died on the cross of Calvary, but arose again so that we can have that hope of eternal life. Father, we have so many that are on our hearts and minds that are sick, that are grieving. Uh, Father, we have friends, we have family. We pray, Father, that you will look down upon them and bless and comfort and strengthen them. Father, as we think about them in our hearts, as we mention them to you, we pray, Father, that you will be with them. Uh, Father, we ask your forgiveness for sins that may be amiss in our life. Father, we know if we confess those that you're faithful and just to forgive us. And we thank you for that. For the pandemic, Father, and other things that are going on in our country, the unrest, we ask your blessings and that you will look down and have mercy upon us, that peace might prevail, and that, Father, we may be able to get through this virus and this epidemic, pandemic. And, Father, for the unrest, that we may come together and love one another more and more each day. Father, pray that you'll be with us tonight in our studies. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10 in just a moment. We ended last week with the idea, really. We touched on verse 10 just very briefly, but we really ended with the idea of Paul very clearly making it clear. Though we, as apostles, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you except that which has been preached, let him be accursed. Not only did he repeat it once, he, or say it once, he repeated it again. Though we are an angel from heaven, this is the gospel of Christ. This is the one gospel. And Paul makes it very clear that this is not only the one, it is the one and only gospel. And there's a lot of confusion with men today about this one gospel or one uh, uh, Bible, if you will. There are those that we mentioned last week that believe they have latter-day prophecies and uh, latter-day revelations that ha have an equal part with the inspired Word of God that we have before us. We have 66 books, 39 in the Old and 27 in the New. And of those 66 books, Romans 15, 4, Paul makes it very clear that those things were written aforetime, were written for our learning. We are to rightly divide, 2 Timothy 2, 15, as we rightly divide from old to new, from the patriarchal to the mosaic to the, to the Christian dispensation. We are to embrace the changes that have been made, but always understand that it has always, if you will, been under one roof. And that one roof is the Word of God, the inspired book that we call the Holy Bible. And so that's what we're looking at, and that's what Paul is directing our attention to as we begin here in verse 10. So let's read a couple of verses, and then we'll come back and talk about that. Verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What we have here is the Judaizing teachers that, and, and they were pressing for the circumcision. They were pressing for it so hard that they believed that one could not be saved apart from one being circumcised. And so that Judaism was being uh, preached and it was being pushed and the salvation of Christ was being pushed aside. And to get more of an enlightenment on this particular situation that was going on, one could turn to Acts chapter 15, which we commonly call the Jerusalem Conference. And there, in verse 1, in the English Standard Version, it says, But some men came down from Judea 
and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So there's the gist of the problem. There's the troublemakers that Paul was speaking of. They're the ones that were coming and not necessarily preaching another gospel, but perverting the gospel that had been preached, which was the one and only true gospel. And so that's what Paul is talking about as he gets into this. Verse 5 of Acts 15, we read another declaration, if you will, where he said, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it's necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. They did not want to let go of the law of Moses. There are those today that do not want to let go of the law of Moses. There are those today who do not understand that that law was written aforetime for our learning. Who do not understand the book of Hebrews clearly indicates and dictates very clearly. Uh, that was then and this is now. That was good, but what we have today is better. Whether it is talking about the high priest Melchizedek and Christ being superior or whether it's the old and the new being superior to the old. In laws and books, all of these things are very clearly throughout the book. So the useful uh, concepts that you and I need to keep in mind uh, that Paul is trying to enlighten the churches in Galatia uh, is, again, proclaiming uh, the, the gospel of Christ, uh, that keeping the law in Mo of Moses in order to be saved is not, is not in line uh, with where they need to be. And Galatians 1 and verse 10 kind of puts everything in perspective with the accusations that have come Paul's way. Uh, they have hurled accusations that he's not an apostle of God, he's an apostle of men. They've hurled accusations concerning the gospel. That's why Paul jumped right in to a defense of the gospel uh, in the very first part of Galatians chapter 1. So he says, for, I am now, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? You and I are living in a politically and socially correct world today. And everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon of whatever the the, the going trend may be in being politically or socially correct. Uh, it doesn't mean that all of the time that there are not some things that we need to be correct about socially, even politically. But our main focus as children of the living God is to be scripturally correct. And so when we deal with issues of our time, and there are plenty of them, we need to make sure that we're focusing on what the Bible says. That we're focusing on what we're going to be judged by in the last day. And so Paul is asking, am I trying to please God or am I trying to please man? And Paul is saying, by my very teachings and by, by, by very actions, I'm not trying to be so politically or socially correct that I'm pleasing man over God. It's nice when both of those will come together, but that doesn't all, that's not always the case. Verse 10 begins with the word for. And the word for connects us to what we previously talked about uh, in uh, the uh, verses 8 and 9. Paul said that anyone who does not teach uh, what he taught is a curse. And uh, it's very clear that he's not trying to get the approval of men by teaching them what they want to hear. We certainly have enough of that today, don't we? There's a lot of teaching and preaching and tickling of the ears of giving men what they want to hear, telling folks what they want to hear, jumping on the bandwagon of what folks want to, to hear or the majority want to hear. The majority's never been a safe bet, folks. And the majority's not a safe bet when it comes to being right in the eyes of Almighty God today. Jesus made it very clear there's a broad way and there's a narrow way. The broad way leads to destruction, and that's where the majority are heading. The narrow way leads to life everlasting, and that's where we want to find and we want to go. So he's not diluting. He's not watering down. He's not trying to be a people pleaser. When you try to be a people pleaser, what happens is 
You're always going to find that there's going to be some group or some individuals that you're not pleasing. And that's why when you're trying to be a people pleaser, you wind up not pleasing anyone, not even God. And so we need to make sure that we're focusing on pleasing God. And then those that want to go along with that and those that want to be a part of that, that's wonderful. And we are very blessed that we can have that commonality together. But there are plenty that do not. Notice in verse 10 why he is not going to be a people pleaser. He says, if I were still trying to please man, I'd not be a servant of Christ. If I try to please people, I cannot be a servant of Christ. This is a message that we need to hear today. We need to hear this message. Stop trying to please men. Be pleasing to Christ. Once again, we want to love one another. We want to even love our enemies and bless those that curse us, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount. But when we go so overboard that we begin to try to do everything to please man, we wind up not pleasing the one that should be most near and dear to us. We must have Jesus rather than the approval of man. We've got to desire Jesus more than the approval of friends or our jobs. Or for that matter, even our family. Sometimes it's a difficult thing and a slippery slope and a hard decision, but it is a necessary one. If we want to have the kind of love we need to have, we can either serve God's desire or people. But we can't serve both. Again, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you've got to choose. You've got to make sure you can either serve God or mammon. You can either do the things of God or do the thing, things of men. And when we look at the world's opinion or opinions, even of, of those around us, the gospel removes that human pleasing attitude that one might have by saying, we'll settle this not by what you think or what I think, even within the Lord's church, but by what the scriptures say, by what the Bible has to tell us. And when we do that, it takes a load off of us, doesn't it? Because it's no longer me making that decision. It's no longer me having to uh, decide this or, or make a decision on it. It's God doing that. Whether I like it or not, whether I approve of it or not, doesn't carry any weight at all. Not with God, and it shouldn't with you and I as well. We don't need all the approval of those around us. We just need God's approval. God has delivered us, as we found out as we look at our scripture, from the present evil age. And so since God has removed us from the pre present evil age, then all I want to do is please God and not be so wrapped up in pleasing everybody else. So I have to ask, which matters to us most? Think about that for a moment for you. Answer too quickly and say, oh, it's pleasing God. Think about it. Don't think about how easy it is to say what you're supposed to say or say what you feel like you need to say, but say what is true in your life. What have you demonstrated? Are you more interested in what your family thinks, what your friends think, what the community, what the whoever in the world thinks? Or are you interested most in what God has to say and what he thinks? That's the thing that we have to examine. John 5, 44, how can you believe when you receive the glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes only from God? Proverbs 29, 25, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. We've got to desire the approval of God. We've got to desire the approval of Christ in our life. And the only way we can have the approval of God or Christ, Paul again says in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God. If you study and you follow, you believe it, you follow, you can be approved of God. You don't have to be ashamed, but you can be approved of God. So when we look at these things, we find out that we're told very clearly that we cannot change the gospel message just because we simply don't like it. We can't change the gospel message for any reason. It is what it is. It will make us acceptable 
to God. Not acceptable to the world, but it will make us acceptable to God. And when all is said and done and we bow before the mighty throne of Almighty God, what's going to matter? Being acceptable from the world or being acceptable from Him? I think the answer is very clear, isn't it? So Paul is not softening the message as some have claimed. But he is holding fast and we must also hold fast to the Word of God. We must stick to what we have in the scriptures, even though folks say, well, you're being dogmatic. No, we're just abiding by the word. You're being legalistic. No, we're just doing what God has instructed us to do. We cannot loose where God has bound. We need not bound where God has loosed. We must be obedient. Extremes are never a good way to start. It's not good in our nation today or at any time to go to extremes. We see the results in our world today. We see our res the results today when folks go to extremes. What happens? And so we need to be devoted to God and the things that we do and the things that we say. And uh, this is what Paul proclaims in verse 11 and 12. His message is not a human message. Uh, just as he said when he opened the letter, the gospel message Paul proclaimed uh, is not given him from a person, uh, nor was he taught this message by anyone, received it by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 13, we go on in our reading. He says, you've heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and, it, and uh, profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came unto the regions of Syria and Cilicia. It was unknown by the face unto the churches of Judea, uh, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. So in the very opening of the letter, in the very first chapter, Paul declares very clearly where he stands and why he is where he is. Not because man put him there, but because God put him there. So he uses himself as an example concerning the revelation of the gospel. And he, and he shows us how radically the gospel has changed him. How radically uh, his former life was turned upside down. Where he once persecuted the church of Almighty God, now he is building it up and he's preaching about it and he's encouraging folks to be a part of it. And I know uh, whether it was the Judaizing teachers and many others doubted him. This is a trap. This is the man that was going in and pulling folks out of houses, arresting them, persecuting them, being a part of murdering them. This is that man. This is the man that was a part of Stephen's stoning. This is that man. And so he's just trying to get to us in whatever way he can. When you think of the weight of the words that he's using here, when he talks about the tradition of the Father versus the doctrine of Jesus Christ, that one gospel. So many today hold up the tradition of the fathers over the gospel of Christ. There are certainly good traditions. There are certainly some that's all right to hold on to. But any tradition that usurps the authority of Almighty God, that usurps the doctrine of Jesus Christ, is not a tradition that we need to embrace. We need to ask ourselves, is this a matter of faith or is this a matter of opinion? And if it's a matter of opinion, we all got him. But if it's a matter of faith, then we need to look to those 
that we find, uh, this doctrine that we find in the Word of God. So God clearly here has a plan for Paul. This was not what Paul uh, expected in his life. It was not what Paul went searching for in his life. Uh, and yet it was what Paul found himself doing. He set him apart before his birth to preach Jesus among the Gentiles. This was God's mission for Paul and call Paul by grace. And certainly we know that Paul had the ability to say no, uh, but he didn't. He didn't. Uh, and his conversion and subsequent preaching uh, could only be the result of the grace of God. God loved him so much and he loves us. Uh, and it's only by divine intervention that the grace of God can change us. And it will uh, if we will allow it. This is what Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespass and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prime of the prince of power uh, of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom uh, we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying our desires uh, of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved and raised up uh, uh, with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in coming ages he might show immeasurable uh, riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He goes on in that Ephesian letter to tell us we're saved by grace through faith. Through faith. What faith? We've talked about that faith. That faith that comes by hearing and the hearing by the word of God. It is hearing the word of God. It is believing that word and it is responding by actions to what we have been taught and what we heard. We're called by the grace of God. If we understand that we've been called by grace, then that should change everything about us. It doesn't give us a license to sin. It should make us more and more appreciative and more and more loving to the things that God has set forth. Notice that this message uh, for the rest of this chapter, uh, in verse 17, Paul says that he did not go to Jerusalem to see any apostles, but went to Arabia, then to Damascus. Then after three years, he went to Jerusalem, saw Peter, uh, seeing none of the other apostles. He only saw James, the brother of Jesus, verse 18 and 19. Think about the three-year period. We often talk about the Damascus Road experience, but it was more than that, the contact that he had with Jesus Christ. He had three years in the Arabian desert where he was being taught, uh, where he was being instructed. Three years. Uh, Paul did not get introduced to all the churches. He did not even meet with all the apostles. He was with Peter 15 days. No one in Jerusalem had seen Paul uh, in the years that transpired after his conversion to Jesus. But what they did know, verse 23 says, they only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. That's all they knew. This is what we've been told. We hear that this one that once tore the church apart, is now trying to build it back up. He, the people heard about his changed life, and I'm sure there were those that didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. Colossians 1, or Colossians 3, beginning with verse 1, says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. The right hand of God set your mind on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you've died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And Christ, who is your life in your life, is appears. And then you also will appear with him in glory. Think about it. Being raised with Christ. We're talking about baptism. We're talking about that burial, Romans chapter 6. We're talking about that being the way to get in to the church, the Lord's church. That's what Paul did when he was Saul of Tarsus. We find Ananias in 
Acts 22 and verse 16, asking him what he's waiting for. Rise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord is not some vocal exercise that someone says. We know that's not the case. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what? Doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. So it requires action on your part and my part, not just simply a vocal exercise that cries out to God. There's an action that must be taken. And once we're buried with Christ after our belief, repentance, and confessing the name of Christ, and we're buried with Christ in baptism, then we arise to be a new creature. Old things done away with. Behold, all things are now new. Look at it yourself. Read it yourself. Come to the conclusion that this one gospel message that Paul is proclaiming and showing and that we'll continue to look at throughout the book of Galatians. This one gospel message is what we'll say. The power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1 and verse 16. You've got to decide if you're going to plug into that power or are you going to keep listening to what the traditions of man has to say. The traditions of men will not save you, but the blood of Jesus Christ will. Would you bow with me as we dismiss? Father, thank you. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for your son and the blood that he shed so that we can have that hope of eternal life. Help us, Father, to take this precious word. Help those that are listening online and those that are listening uh, all around. Help them to understand the seriousness of your word. And, Father, those that are not children of yours, help them accept the way that they need to accept. Do the things they need to do. Believe that you are, Jesus Christ is the son of you. And, and that by believing, they're willing to repent of their sins, confess the name, and be buried in baptism now, Father. Now. Now is the time. Today is the day. Father, help us to be that encouragement and that example that we can be. We pray that you'll go with us, Father. Watch over and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen.